This video is sponsored by JLC PCB. More about that later. Batteries. Big ones, little ones, round ones, disgusting ones, even poop covered ones, they all have one thing in common. They all degrade over time. I build a lot of projects that use batteries, like my RC snowplow robot or the electric tractor. As a result, I often need to test batteries to see if they're still good. One way you can do this is by taking a piece of steel wire and shorting it across the terminals. Looks like this one's still good. A slightly less unhinged way to test it is to take a multimeter and measure the voltage. But neither of these methods tell me the battery's capacity. The best way to find this out is to charge the battery to 100% and then discharge it while logging the amount of charge taken out of the battery. To put it more verbosely, we need to integrate the current across a full discharge cycle. You can do this with one of these little smart chargers which can be bought for like $30. These work okay, but they have some limitations. First of all, they only work for lithium ion batteries that have the balance wires exposed, so it couldn't discharge a battery with a built-in BMS. And secondly, these are really limited in terms of the current they can can draw. This one can only draw up to 1 amp, which means this battery could take roughly 50 hours to drain. I don't know about you, but my Gen Z brain can't even comprehend waiting that long for something. So the easiest solution is to forget about this nonsense and just use a resistor. Suppose I want to draw 5 amps, which should allow this battery to fully drain in about 6 hours. Never mind the fact that you should really only discharge lead acid batteries to 50%, that's outside the scope of this part of the video. The voltage is about 12 volts, so we can use Ohm's law to find the necessary resistance. R equals V over I, R equals 12 over 5, and we get R equals 2.4 ohms. The closest I could find is 3.3 ohms, so let's just try that. Uh, that one was probably defective. Let's try again. Okay, third time's the charm. Well, we just learned how to make a DIY model rocket igniter. The problem is that 12 volts across 3.3 ohms creates over 40 watts of power, and this resistor is rated for a quarter of a watt. Okay, new plan. This is a 1 ohm resistor rated for 225 watts, so it should be able to handle the power. Let's try it. Pro tip, don't use thin wires for high currents. Now with some thicker cables, we're getting the expected current draw of about 12 amps. So it didn't catch fire, that's a good sign. But to actually determine the capacity of this battery, we need a way to log the current draw at regular intervals. The easiest way to do this is to get an ammeter like this and have my unpaid intern record the current at fixed time intervals. If you don't have an intern, then the next easiest way is to use a current sensor like this, which is an ACS712. I can hook this up to a Raspberry Pi through an analog to digital converter and then run the script I wrote. The script takes a reading from the ADC once a second, converts the raw analog reading into a current measurement, and then logs this in a CSV file. It also prints out each measurement, along with the accumulated charge in amp hours. As you can see, it works. However, this current sensor has a downside. The current has to actually flow through this tiny screw terminal, along some thin PCB traces, and through the chip itself. This means we can really only measure currents under 5 amps, otherwise this whole PCB starts getting quite hot. To solve this, we can use this circuit I built. This is called a shunt resistor, or current shunt, or current sense resistor, or look, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's just a resistor with a really low resistance. This one is 0 0.0015 ohms. By putting this in series with the load, it will produce a voltage proportional to the current flowing through it. The downside is that the voltage across it is really, really small. Like when this load is drawing 13 amps, the voltage across here is only 0 0.02 volts. So I made this circuit, which uses an op amp to multiply the voltage here by 100 times. Then, the analog to digital converter chip lets my Raspberry Pi computer sense the voltage. I made this Python script, which reads the voltage once per second, calculates the current, which is just the voltage measurement divided by the sense resistance divided by the amplifier gain, and then logs it to a CSV file. Let's test it out. I've connected an adjustable power supply in place of a battery because it allows me to limit the current. I'll start off at around 9 amps, and then decrease the current in a couple of steps. Then I can import the CSV file into Google Sheets and create a graph, and it looks exactly like I would expect. The current value matches what I was setting it to, and the accumulated amp hours goes up at a rate proportional to the current. This all works fine for relatively low voltages and currents, but suppose I want to test this 36 volt battery, or the 72 volt battery I built for the electric tractor. If I were to just hook that up to this 1 ohm resistor, it would draw over 5,000 watts of power and turn this resistor into a molten puddle of metal and whatever else resistors are made of. Enter the resistance wire. This is made from an alloy called nichrome. Ni as in nickel and chrome as in 
chrome. Most wires are designed to have as little resistance as possible, which is why they're usually made from copper or aluminum. To make a heating element from ordinary wire, you'd need to use a very long and thin strand to get a suitable resistance, which would make it very fragile. This, on the other hand, has a resistivity around 70 times greater than that of copper and doesn't oxidize or become brittle. This makes it perfect for turning into custom heating elements. I made this one, which has a resistance of 0.6 ohms. When connected to a 12 volt battery, it should draw 20 amps. Let's try it out. Pro tip, don't place hot things on a wooden bench top. So this works and it's fairly easy to adjust the length of the heating element to achieve different current levels. But maybe you don't want a glowing red hot wire sitting around in your house for whatever reason. Well, it's time we move beyond these cave person era methods of discharging a battery. Enter the MOSFET. A MOSFET is a type of transistor, and they're typically used to switch loads on and off by applying around 10 volts to this pin called the gate. When you do this, it allows current to flow into this pin called the drain and out of this pin called the source. Very little power is dissipated by the FET itself because its on resistance is only a few milliohms. However, if we apply only a small voltage to the gate pin, we can cause the FET to have a higher on resistance. This essentially gives us an adjustable load which is controlled by a voltage source. Compared to just using a fixed value resistor, this is a much more flexible solution. You might think you could just hook up the load to the battery, measure the current once, and then multiply it by the amount of time it takes for the battery to fully drain. Wrong! There are multiple reasons why this approach can give a large error. First of all, as the load heats up, its resistance increases. This is true regardless of whether it's a resistor or a MOSFET. When I connect this 1 ohm resistor to a 10 volt power supply, it initially draws about 9.2 amps, but over time, you can see the current decreasing as the resistor gets hotter. Also, the voltage of a battery gradually decreases as it drains, so the current drawn by a resistive load will also decrease. Both of these problems will result in the current draw decreasing over time, which means if you just take a current measurement at the start, you're kinda inflating the numbers. To overcome this, I designed this circuit which uses an op-amp to read the voltage across this current shunt and compare it against a fixed reference voltage. It will automatically adjust the voltage of the gate pin such that the voltage across the shunt resistor matches the reference voltage. Essentially, it's a constant current source. So then I took this circuit and multiplied it by 4 so that it can handle more power, and added a bunch of other complicated stuff. Let's blast through that in 59 seconds. There are four IRFP4768 MOSFETs, each theoretically capable of dissipating 520 watts, provided I've provided proper power dissipation paths. Each FET has its own op-amp circuit and a 5 milliohm current shunt. The reference voltage for each of these circuits comes from an MCP4725 12-bit digital-to-analog converter, or DAC. This then gets reduced through a voltage divider by a factor of 22. A Raspberry Pi Zero controls the DAC using I2C, along with all the other chips that I haven't yet mentioned, but I'm about to do so. This chip, called the INA228, monitors the total current, voltage, power, and energy, charge, and die temperature. Not only that, it does so with ultra-high precision 20-bit ADC. You pay for that precision with money, which is how most things are paid for, but luckily it wasn't my money. These connectors are for four thermistors which let me sense the temperature at various places like the heatsink, the PCB, and the battery. Since the Pi can't read analog voltages, this analog to digital converter or ADC lets the Pi actually read the values from the temperature sensors. This connector is for a fan, which the Pi can switch on or off with this MOSFET. The board is powered by 12 volts from this connector, and this buck converter circuit drops the voltage down to 5 volts to power the Pi. The end. Next, I laid the circuit out as a four layer PCB, and then it was time to order the boards. Of course, I ordered them from JLC PCB, who is the sponsor of this video. I've been using JLC PCB as my default PCB shop for almost 10 years, so when they contacted me asking if I'd be down for a sponsorship, I was like, heck yeah. I've ordered dozens of different PCBs from them, and the speed, quality, and cost is always excellent. For this project, I designed the schematic and PCB using Easy EDA, which is JLC PCB's own online eCAD tool. It's tightly integrated with their ordering system so once you're done designing, you can order your boards right away. You just click this, and then this, and now they have your files, and you can get a quote within minutes. One to eight layer PCBs start from $2, and they can be made in as little as 24 hours. Since this is a high current electronic load, I went with four layers and thicker two ounce copper, and I also decided to use the assembly service. Usually, I just assemble boards myself, but this was so much easier. They handled all the part sourcing, and it somehow even ended up being cheaper than if I had ordered the components and soldered everything myself. Check out the video description for a coupon, and thanks to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. Once the boards arrived, I installed my Raspberry Pi, hooked up a 12 volt power adapter to power the board, and started to test things out. I set up the Raspberry Pi for headless operation, which just means that it doesn't have a graphical user interface. Rather than having to connect a mouse, keyboard, and monitor to the Pi, I just used my desktop computer to remotely access it using SSH. Next, I ran the I2C detect command, which identified that there were three I2C devices connected, and the addresses all matched what I expected based on my schematic. Then I hooked up my adjustable power supply to the input terminals of the load, and I noticed that it immediately tried to draw 10 amps. 
That is not a good sign. However, it was an easy fix. It turns out that the DAC, which sets the reference voltage for the constant current circuit, doesn't output zero volts by default. To fix this, I just had to change a value in the DAC's memory so that the default value on power up is zero. Now the current draw is much lower. It still isn't zero, but given that this board is designed to handle 50 amps, the discrepancy is less than 1%, so I'm not too concerned. Next, I made this Python script which lets me set the load current. If I set it to 1 amp, we should see about 1 amp on the display of the power supply. That's good enough for me. This script displays the temperatures from each of the four thermistors. It does this by reading the voltage from the voltage divider created by the thermistor, calculating the resistance, and then finding the closest corresponding temperature value in a lookup table. The datasheet for the thermistors provides the lookup table, so I just took a screenshot of it and told ChatGPT to reformat it into a Python array. Right now, they're all around 20 degrees C, but if I carefully heat up one of them, you can see the temperature shoots up to 43 degrees C. Then I made another script called temp control to control the fans. I can set a threshold to make the fan turn on and off like a thermostat. Right now, it's set to turn on at 40 degrees and turn off at 35 degrees. Even though these MOSFETs are pretty large, they still can't dissipate much power on their own without getting really hot. To get the best performance, you need to add a heatsink. I found this one in my bin of heatsinks, which I think came from a broken power supply. I had to drill a few holes in it and tap them with M3 threads, and then I applied some of this yucky slime to each MOSFET and screwed them into the heatsink. I also drilled a hole in the top of the heatsink to install a thermistor, which I also coated in the yucky slime. Next, I performed a test where I gradually increased the current draw while logging the temperature. I wanted to see how much power this device could continuously dissipate. I found that at 140 watts, the temperature reached 74 degrees C, which is where I decided to stop the test. Of course, this is steady state operation, so the device could certainly handle more power for shorter amounts of time. Finally, the last script combines everything into one nice package called battery test. I can set a low voltage cutoff, a capacity limit, time limit, and temperature thresholds. I got a bunch of lithium ion batteries from a friend who abandoned me, I mean moved away for work, and I'd like to see what condition they're in. I'll hook up this fully charged 3 cell pack and set the device to draw 3 amps, with a low voltage cutoff of 9 volts. <laughs> One hour later. So here's the data. You can see the temperature oscillating between 40 and 45 degrees C as the temperature control script toggles the fan on and off. The voltage curve looks exactly like the typical lithium ion discharge curve, and the accumulated capacity maxed out at 2,298 milliamp hours. Given that this is supposedly a 3,000 milliamp hour battery, we can conclude that its state of health is roughly 77%. Now, I did this test at 3 amps, which, given that this is a 3 amp hour battery, corresponds to 1 C. But what if I repeated the test drawing 1.5 amps, aka half C? I predict that the usable capacity of the battery will be greater. This may seem counterintuitive. Shouldn't the capacity be the same regardless of the current draw? Perhaps that would be the case in a perfect world where cows are spherical, the atmosphere doesn't exist, and a battery is an ideal voltage source. But unfortunately, we're stuck living in reality where the atmosphere does exist, cows are cow-shaped, and batteries have some internal resistance. This means that the more current you draw from the battery, the more the voltage drop across this internal resistance increases, reducing the voltage at the load. This means that the battery will reach its cutoff voltage earlier, at higher currents. Conversely, when a small current is drawn from the battery, the voltage stays higher for longer, so the more energy you can draw before the cutoff voltage is reached. There are some other more chemistry e reasons, but those will be left as an exercise for the viewer. If you look at a battery's datasheet, and if it's a decent datasheet, it should have a discharge curve plotted at different currents. Take the Molly Cell P42A, for example. It shows discharge curves at five different currents, from 0.84 amps, or 0.2 C, all the way up to 30 amps, which is just over 7 C. As you can see, the average voltage drops as the current goes up, and the usable capacity drops with it. But not all batteries come with datasheets that include a graph like this. Some batteries don't come with any datasheets at all. So let's do some testing to try and create our own graph, using the same 3-cell lithium-ion battery from earlier. I repeated the discharge test at various currents to get curves for 3C, 2C, 1C, half c and a quarter c Then I put all the data into a single graph, and viola, it looks a lot like the discharge curve from the molly-cell datasheet, just worse. I mean, the graph looks sick, 
but the performance of the battery isn't very good, probably because it's over 10 years old and was used in a racing drone, which is a very demanding application. I'm just impressed that it still works at all. Well, I've got to stop somewhere. I'm pretty happy with how this device turned out, and I plan to use it a lot more in the future to test more batteries before using them in my projects. I also want to do some experimenting to see how temperature affects battery performance, but first I'll need to make some sort of DIY thermal chamber. If you want the schematic and project files to order this device yourself, I've uploaded it all to my Patreon page and made it public. Remember to subscribe, and as always, thanks to my paid patrons whose names are being shown on screen. Thanks for watching, and I promise another tractor video is coming soon.